world today, we have disgraced and discarded the Seventh Commandment that clearly says, you shall not commit adultery. But there's a reason why this commandment was given to us by God. So we'd reserve sex for the safe confines of marriage. I'm Pastor Jeff Shreve, and we're in my new series, Written in Stone, where today, God will remind us of the sacredness of sex. In 1631, Robert Barker and Martin Lucas, the royal printers in London, reprinted the King James Bible. But they had one error in the reprint. It was a, a minor error if you think about all the words in the King James Bible. It was just one word, one little word, one three-letter word but it was a colossal mistake. And that mistake was found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. You shall not commit adultery, the Scripture reads, but they left out the word not. You shall commit adultery is the way their version of the Bible read it is known to this day as the wicked Bible, the sinner's Bible, the adulterous Bible. And those two guys lost their license to print anything else. They were fined significantly. And as one uh, report said, they almost lost their lives for leaving out the word not. Now, we're in a series on the Ten Commandments, and we're going through... Uh, commandment by commandment, and today we're on commandment number 7, Exodus 20, verse 14, you shall not, emphasize not, uh, commit adultery. Now, that's a very simple, straightforward verse, but it's packed with meaning as we see God's heart toward the sacredness, the holiness of the sexual union between a husband and wife. Now, in our world today, we have so thrown the seventh commandment to the dogs, so to speak, and we have disregarded it and disgraced it and degraded it and discarded it, and we say, oh, that's so passe. But there's a reason why that commandment was written on the tablet of stone written by the finger of God. You know, it has well been said when we talk about breaking God's commandments, you don't really break God's commandments. You're broken on them. And people in our world today are so broken when it comes to the seventh commandment. I was looking online at the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, uh, and they said this, one in five people in America 68 million people have a sexually transmitted disease, one in five. They don't even like to call it STDs anymore because they think that sounds too harsh. So they call it an STI, a sexually transmitted infection. But we know what it is. It's a sexually transmitted disease. 26 million new STDs in 2018, and half of those cases were in people ages 15 to 24 years old. The cost of the new STD cases, $16 billion a year. You don't break God's commandments. You're broken on God's commandments because the commands of God stand, and God's Word will last forever and ever and ever. So we want to look today at this command, very simple, straightforward command, you shall not commit adultery and unpack what all that means to you and to me today as it relates to the sacredness, the holiness of the sexual union between a husband 
and a wife. So three insights for this morning. Number one, God created sex solely for the safe confines of marriage. Now, as I've told you before, any time we start talking about sex in a Baptist church, Baptists get nervous. We don't like to talk about sex. Why? Because we think it might lead to dancing. And so we get <laughs> nervous about this. Oh, the pastor's talking about sex. He's not supposed to talk about sex. Howard Hendricks, the great uh, professor at Dallas Theological Seminary who's in heaven now, he said we should never be ashamed to talk about what God wasn't ashamed to create. And God created sex. And if you go back to the dawn of civilization, when God made a man, Adam, Genesis chapter 2, you know, every day when God would create and say, and God saw what he made and it was good and it was good and it was good and it was good and it was good. And then we read about Adam and the Lord says, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable to him, a helper that corresponds to him. And God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he performed the very first surgery. And he pulled out of the man from his side a rib and some flesh. And he fashioned this creature called woman, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And in the Hebrew, she shall be called Isha, woman, because she was taken out of Ish, man. And so he is so excited about this creature that God brought to him. And then the scripture goes on to say, not speaking uh, directly to Adam and Eve, but to all of us, for this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother. Adam and Eve didn't have a father and mother. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And that is how God set it up, the blueprints of marriage. And so God created sex solely for the safe confines of marriage. Now, notice some things about uh, this design of sex. It's designed for oneness in the marriage. The two shall become one flesh. Now, that happens physically when a man and and his wife come together in the marriage. We talk about the consummation of the marriage where you come together as one flesh. And God created men and women different so that they would complement one another. And it's oneness, not just physical oneness, but it's to be a oneness in marriage of body and soul and spirit. And it's pictured in the beautiful union of the sexual relationship. Now, 1 Corinthians 6.16 picks up on this and says, or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a harlot is one body with her? For he says, the two will become one flesh. Hey, don't join yourself to a harlot because that's joining to become one flesh. And so that is reserved just for a husband and his wife. So God designed that there would be oneness in this marriage relationship. Secondly, God designed sex for procreation in the marriage. And he said to Adam and Eve in a summation chapter, Genesis chapter 1, Genesis 2 backtracks a little bit on day 6 because in Genesis 2, Eve isn't created yet until the end of the chapter. But in Genesis 1, the Lord's giving us an overview, and he says this in verses 27 and 28, and God created man... In his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. So we learn some things right off the bat that our world seems to have forgotten, that there are two sexes and there are two genders And sex and gender are connected, and you cannot separate those things. Everyone in this room, everyone watching online, you're either an XY male or you're an XX female, and you can never change that. So 
We learn a lot from the book of Genesis. We learn that God made them male and female, and God made Adam and God made Eve, and God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. How do we do that? We do that through the sexual relationship between Adam and Eve, between a husband and his wife. So God created uh, sex to be that expression of oneness in the marriage, and the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. There was perfect oneness there in the Garden of Eden until they sinned in Genesis chapter 3. And then for procreation. How do you get more kids? You, you have sex in the marriage and that produces kids. And I heard about a man, and he was asked by his nine-year-old son. He said, Dad, he said, where did I come from? And the father said, I'm, excuse me? He said, well, tell me, Dad, where did I come from? And the dad's like, man, you're only, he's only nine years old. He's already asking where he came from. He said, it's the facts of life. Where's his mother? But the mother wasn't around. So he's like, okay, I got, I got to talk to him. And so he talks to little Johnny, and he says, uh, well, Johnny, here's how it is. And he went through the whole shebang, and, and he was saying about, you know, about fertilization and the egg and, and all this, and then the baby is born and everything, and little Johnny's eyes are getting wider and wider. He goes, wow, wow. He said, well, Johnny, why did you ask? He said, well, I just wondered. He said, Billy from across the street, he said he came from Philadelphia. <laughs> God designed sex for procreation in the marriage. And thirdly, he designed sex for pleasure in the marriage. You know, the Lord could have made it to where the sexual union between a husband and wife was just neutral. Was, there was no pleasure involved. God didn't create us like that. He could have created it where it's just pain, you know, uh, coming together to procreate. It was like having a root canal. And people, I mean, it had been Adam and Eve, and once Cain killed Abel, that was it. You know, I mean, it, just no more, you know. And uh, because it would be like, I'm not doing that. That hurts. But he didn't create it like that. He created it where there's this, this fire, there's this, this, this excitement, and there's pleasure involved, and that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. And even the Bible tells us about that. Song of Solomon, chapter 7. Listen what Solomon says about his wife. I believe this was his first wife. He had 700 of them, but this is the first one. This is before he kind of fell off the wagon here. And he says, how beautiful. She's probably dancing before him. He's really enjoying what he sees. How beautiful and how delightful you are, my love, with all your charms. Your stature is like a palm tree, and your breasts are like its clusters. I said... I will climb the palm tree, and I will take hold of its fruit stalks. Oh, may your breasts be like clusters of the vine, and the fragrance of your breath like apples, and your mouth like the best wine. Solomon is really enjoying his wife and how she looks. Men are very visual. And there's nothing wrong with that. God exalts that. He created sex to be pleasurable, but only in marriage. This is what he says in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 3. He said, let the husband fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another. God is pro-sex in marriage. And the husband does, fulfills his duty to his wife, and the wife fulfills her duty to her husband. And when Debbie and I got were first married and I ran across 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I would tell her in the morning, Debbie, I'm reporting for duty. <laughs> just wanted her to know because that's, just want to be a doer of the word and uh, <laughs> reporting for duty. So when we think about sex in marriage, See, God designed it only in marriage. Think about sex this way. Sex is like fire. It's like a roaring fire. In your home, there's only one place for a roaring fire, and that's the fireplace. You don't want a roaring fire in your attic. You don't want a roaring fire in the living room rug. 
You don't, you want it only in the fireplace. So sex is fire and marriage is the fireplace. And God says, hey, I want you to have a roaring fire, but only in the safe confines of marriage. So that's the first insight. God created sex solely for the safe confines of marriage. It is sacred. It is holy in marriage. Second insight. Adultery is a sexual sin that attacks the sanctity of marriage, the purity of marriage, the, the holiness of marriage. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all, the married and the unmarried. Hold marriage in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Fornicators and adulterers. Now in the seventh commandment, Remember when we learned on our fingers, the seventh commandment, what is that? You shall not commit adultery. These two don't do anything with these other folks, right? That's the seventh commandment. But is it just adultery? Is God only saying you shall not commit adultery, but you can commit fornication? So if you're not married, uh, you can have sex with lots of people as long as they're not married. No, the seventh commandment for forbids adultery and fornication. Fornication is what people do when they're not married and they have sex with someone who is not married. They haven't committed adultery, but they have committed fornication. And Hebrews 13, 4 says, fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. The Lord is very clear about this and he's very strong about this. Let the marriage bed be undefiled. So it forbids both of those things. Secondly, it forbids any sexual immorality. So you take the Bible and you start piecing the Bible together with other parts of the Bible. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God. Lots of people want to know, what's the will of God? What's the will of God? What's the will of God for my life? This is the will of God. Your sanctification, your holiness, that is that you abstain from sexual immorality. Now the word that's used there in the Greek is pornea, from which we get our word pornography. And pornea is a very broad term. It covers all types of sexual immorality. It covers adultery. It covers fornication. It covers homosexuality. It covers all sorts of bestiality. It covers just a big blanket term. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Now, when you talk to couples that are dating, high school couples, college couples, and in today's world, I mean, it's nothing, it's sad to say, but it's nothing for people to meet and boom, they have sex on the very first date. Well, that, that's, just, that's just blowing past Hebrews 13.4. That's just showing I have no fear of God. Fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. And we're to live in the fear of the Lord always. But here's the thing. You have couples, Christian couples, and they say, well, how far can I go before I cross the line? You know, they want to know that. And what can we do? Can we, can we kiss? What can we do? Can, is, there, is there a limit? I had a friend of mine one time, he, he talked about technical virginity. You know, we're, we're not having intercourse, but we're, we're getting close. And listen, the goal of the Christian life is not to see how close you can come to the edge before you fall off. It's to keep yourself unstained by the world. And so what is the, what is the, where is the line? The line is in your heart because the seventh commandment forbids lust in the heart. Jesus, in the great sermon on the mount, he told the people, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that everyone who looks on a woman to lust for her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he was raising the bar on the Ten Commandments because the people had lowered the bar on the Ten Commandments and they said all that matters is outward. So you shall not murder. So if I haven't murdered anybody, then I fulfilled the Ten Commandments but, uh, or that commandment number six. And Jesus said, hey, if you have hate in your heart toward your brother, you have broken that commandment. And he takes it back to the heart. 
And all throughout the Bible, if you want to know what the Bible is about, God is not interested in rules. He's interested in a relationship with you, and he's interested in the heart. God doesn't see as man sees. Man sees the outward appearance, but the Lord sees the heart. And the Pharisees did everything just meticulously well on the outside, and Jesus said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Your heart is far away, and that's what I want, your heart. And so if you look on a woman to lust for her, if you look on a man, ladies, to lust for him, the Lord says you committed adultery with him already in your heart. You've committed adultery with her already in your heart. And so we know it's not just uh, restricted to, uh, to the marriage relationship, having sex outside of your marriage bounds, because he said to look on, uh, on any woman to lust for her. You've committed adultery. You've committed sexual sin with her in your heart. And see, the heart, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4, watch over your heart, guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the issues and the springs of life. Everything comes out of the heart. Jesus said in Matthew 15, 19, out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and slanders. Where does it come from? It comes from out of the heart. And your heart is connected to your mouth because the mouth speaks from that which fills the heart, and your heart is connected to your eyes because your eyes see what your heart desires. Everything goes back to the heart. Adultery is the sexual sin that attacks the sanctity of marriage. I remember talking to a guy when Debbie and I were speaking with Family Life Ministries. We had the pre-married talk. And so most of the people that come to, to the Family Life Weekend to Remember Marriage Conferences are married, but some weren't. And so we'd have a separate time to just talk to the pre-marrieds. And we talked about sexual purity. And we said, listen, I mean, we're not naive enough to think that everyone that comes to the conference is abstaining from sex. So we knew we were talking to a lot of people that are living together, having sex together, but not married. I remember this one guy challenged me on it. And he said, well, why shouldn't I? Why shouldn't I, you know, just try this out? How am I hurting anybody? And I said, do you believe it's wrong to steal? He said, yes. I said, so that's wrong. If you were going to steal something from somebody, that would be wrong. He said, yes. And I said, you're stealing from this woman's future husband. You don't know that's going to be you. And I said, you're taking from her what belongs to her husband exclusively. So if you don't see that sexual immorality and fornication is wrong, maybe you see that stealing is wrong, and you're stealing from this future husband, and you're defrauding this woman. And I said, that is a terrible sin. Hey, adultery, a sexual sin that attacks and robs and destroys the sanctity of marriage. And then insight number three, the good news. We can safeguard our lives from this devastating sin. Now, I realize that I'm talking to people, and you might be here, and you're like, I don't like this sermon at all because this is hitting really uh, close to home. And I realize that. And just as we sang, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. And I know that, you know, you can't unscramble eggs. And things that you've done in the past that you wish you could go back and redo, well, you can't do that. All you can do is make things right. But what you can do from this morning onward is to say, hey, I'm going to safeguard my life from the devastating sin of pornea, of sexual immorality, of adultery, and of fornication. And I'm going to take uh, God's Word to heart. Let, the mar- let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers. God will judge, and God, I don't want to be a fornicator or an adulterer. I don't want to participate in sexual immorality. It is your will that I abstain from sexual immorality. So how can we safeguard our lives in the world in which we live that's just permeated with sexual immorality, just coming out from every orifice of the nation? How do we protect ourselves? 
First of all, we can make a covenant with our eyes. As Job said in Job 31, verse 1, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? How then could I look upon a maid? You know, the software company uh, Covenant Eyes, they took the name of their company from Job 31.1. And uh, we know that uh, the, the internet and uh, digitally, that's a big, big problem for people. Big, big problem for guys and a growing problem for girls. Looking at things we shouldn't look at on the internet. Well, I have made a covenant with my eyes. I'm not going to look to lust for women. Now, remember, the eye sees what the heart desires, so it's always a heart issue, and you got to go back to the heart and say, why does my heart desire these things? God, give me a heart, give me a passion for you that far exceeds my passion for anything else. That's a prayer I pray on a consistent basis, because as Robert Robinson uh, wrote in that song, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. As Jesus told the church in Ephesus, I have this against you. You have left your first love. You don't love me like you used to. You're wandering from me in your love. It's not white hot like it used to be. So it's always a heart issue. But we can say with Job, okay, I'll make a covenant with my eyes. I'm not going to let my eyes look upon a maid. You know, when we think about David, David, that great man of God, David who had a heart for God, but David, who had a terrible, horrible sin, 2 Samuel chapter 11, came about in the spring of the year when the kings go out to battle that David didn't go. And David was lounging around in his palace, and he got up at the end of the day. People normally get up from bed at the beginning of the day, but he had been in bed all day. He gets up at the cool of the day. He walks about on the roof of his palace, and he sees this beautiful woman bathing, and her name was Bathsheba, and David... He looks, and that right there is the temptation. You look, you saw her. He didn't go out there to see her. He didn't go out to say, I think I got it timed out. Bathsheba takes a bath at 6 p.m. He didn't do that. He is just innocently walking on his palace, and he sees her. And all of a sudden, he's confronted with a temptation. Proverbs 22, verse 3, the prudent sees the evil and hides himself, but the naive go on and are punished for it. And David knew he should have turned away, but he didn't turn away. And the look turned to longing, and the longing turned to lusting, and the lusting turned to laying. And David got his counselors together, his, his entourage, and said, Who is this woman? And they said, That is Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. She's married, David. And David called for her and had a night of passion with her. And it was one night that wrecked the rest of his life, that wrecked his family. One night. There's a high price to pay for sexual immorality. How would David have done if he had said with Job, I'm going to make a covenant with my eyes. I'm not going to look upon a maid. I'm not going to gaze at a virgin. And I'm not going to allow that to fester in my heart. So you and I can make that covenant with our eyes and we can get covenant eyes on our computer, and we can have an accountability partner that helps us in that strong area of temptation. Secondly, we can decide not to play with fire. What did we say earlier? Sex is fire. The only place for fire is in the fireplace, and marriage is the fireplace. That's the safe confines of the sexual relationship. That's the way God made it and God intended, and we can say, I'm not going to play with fire with other people. Proverbs chapter 6, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Of course not. Can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is the one who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her will not go unpunished. So we can make the choice now to say, I'm not going to go in, that, in, the, in the way of temptation. I'm not going to play around with fire. You see somebody that you find very attractive, you just keep your distance from that person. 
You just know, hey, I find you very attractive, so therefore I'm going to always keep my distance from you. I've had to do that through my life because you're always going to find somebody. Uh, you meet people all the time. You think, oh, that person's very, very attractive. Keep your distance from them. See, uh, foolish is the man who says, well, I find this person very attractive. I think I'm going to spend time with them. You're married to somebody else. You don't need to be spending time with this person you find attractive. Hey, if you don't want to fall down, don't walk in slippery, slip, slippery places. And so, therefore, the one who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. And we have people getting into uh, emotional affairs. Uh, how, how does that work, an emotional affair? Well, women are very emotional. Women typically don't go right away for the physical affair. Men want the physical affair. Women want the emotional affair. And emotional affairs always lead to physical affairs because that's just the, the flow of it. And so you can say, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna play with fire. You know, David blew it big time, cost him big time. It, the sword was never going to depart from his family because of his sin. Because of what you did, David, Nathan the prophet said, uh, you have given occasion for the enemies of God to blaspheme. Serious, serious sin. And he followed up his sin of adultery by having Uriah the Hittite killed in battle. He followed that up with murder. I mean, just horrible. And he's a man after God's own heart. So we can take some encouragement from that, saying, okay, as bad as what happened with David, we know that God still forgave him and God still used him. He would tell you and me today if he could come up and preach, don't do what I did. It cost me big time. Does God forgive sin? Yes, but sin leaves scars and don't go there. Much better to follow the example of Joseph in the Bible, Joseph in the book of Genesis. Remember, Joseph was a very handsome guy, a very capable guy. He's, he's in charge of everything in Potiphar's house as the, the number one slave in Potiphar's house. And Mrs. Potiphar saw how handsome and capable and winsome was Joseph, and she wanted to have sex with him. And day after day, she would say, lie with me, lie with me, lie with me. And he said, I can't do that. He said, how can I sin against God by doing that? And Potiphar has put me in charge of everything that he owns. The only thing that's off limits is you, and I'm not going to sin against God by doing that. Well, one day, it, as it turns out, it's just Potiphar's wife and Joseph, and they're in, they're in the house. All the other servants are out of the house, and she grabs him by his coat and says, lie with me. And Joseph, what does he do? He spins out of his coat, and he runs. He didn't try and talk to her about it. He didn't try and say, well, let, let's pray about this. I don't think this is a good thing. Let's pray about it. No, he got out of there. He saturated that place with his absence. And that's what the Bible says do. 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And follow the example of Joseph. And when you are close to the fire like that, get out. Get out. Hey, we, we resist the devil, and he will flee from us. But we don't fight against uh, sexual temptation. We flee sexual temptation. We get away from sexual temptation. Debbie used to tell our girls, listen, if you want to remain pure, girls, it, it's the three words you need to remember. It's just like real estate. Location, location, location. Don't put yourself in a situation where you're going to fall. Get out of there and don't put on the Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 13, 14 says, and make no provision for the flesh with regard to its lusts. So we can decide ahead of time, I'm not going there. I'm not going to play with fire. And then thirdly, we can remember the high cost of sexual sin. The high, high cost of sexual sin. Hey, the Bible talks about Moses, and it says that Moses chose ill treatment with the people of God rather than choosing the passing pleasures of sin. Sexual immorality, there is pleasure in that, just like there's pleasure for a fish to nibble on the bait until the hook comes into play, and then that fish wishes he had never 
started to nibble on the bait. We need to elevate the high cost of sexual immorality. I still remember watching a, an interview that Oprah Winfrey did with a woman who had given herself over to sexual immorality. She did a lot of uh, sexually explicit movies, and she was talking to Oprah, and Oprah was asking her, well, why did you get out of that industry? And she said, I was in the shower one day, and she said, I was washing myself with soap, and I could not wash off the filth. And I had a nervous breakdown, and I had to go to a place for a while to get my mental health back. Couldn't wash off the filth. I have a friend of mine that was working on a series of educational videos for high schools. It's called Fight the New Drug. And it's all about how pornography uh, destroys lives and destroys minds. And he has an interview with a guy that was a pornography actor. And this guy said, I was the most uh, sought after and I, uh, you know, did the most movies. And he was talking about where he was in the industry. And he said this. He said, I was trying to be an actor in Los Angeles. And he said, I, in one week I got a movie and I was thinking, man, this is a pretty good deal. He said, but then there was the writer's strike and everything stopped. And he said, I couldn't make any money. He said, I looked in my cabinet and there was a, a can of beans and a can of, of peas. And he said, that's all I had and I needed to make money. And this person said, well, if you're willing to do some, some modeling, modeling, that you can make some money. And so he called this number and he said, I did my first movie and they paid me $400. And he said, that led to another movie and another movie and another movie. He said, I got to the place in life where I couldn't feel anymore. He said, people talk about making love. He said, what's that? What's that? He said, all I ever did, I was just a prostitute. And he said, and I hated myself. And I wanted out so bad. And this is what he said about it. He said, I did the work. To do, he said, I went to work to do the porn, to make the money, to buy the drugs, to mask the pain of doing the porn and wake up the next day and I'd go to work and do the porn to make the money, to buy the drugs, to mask the pain. And he said, finally, it became so overwhelming. He said, I left the set one day and he said, I was only a couple blocks away and I pulled the car over and I just started to weep. And he cried out to God that God would deliver him from that. And you know what? God did. And God delivered him and set him free from that. And he said, I never went back again. Hey, there's a high, high price for that. It destroys. It's the fire that gets out of the fireplace, and it'll burn your life to the ground. I was listening to an Adrian Rogers sermon this week, and he quoted from Kent Hughes. He said, guys, listen to this. When you as a father, as a husband and father, Commit the sin of adultery. This is what you say to your kids. Four devastating messages you give to your, sin, your kids. Number one, kids, your mother's not worth much. Kids, your dad is a cheat and a liar. Kids, honor is not, as, not nearly as important as pleasure and kids, my own personal satisfaction is more important to me than you are. Four devastating messages. And we need to remember that because, listen, I think that every Christian uh, guy wants to be a man of honor, a man of integrity. Every Christian dad wants to be a dad that kids can look up to. I don't want to hate myself. You don't want to hate yourself. We want to be able to stand before the Lord and say, Lord, I walked with you. Lord, I walked in the light. Lord, I dealt with the sin in my life. And I didn't let that foul and fester. Hey, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, us with God, and the blood of Jesus, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. 
Magnify the consequences of the sin. Put that down in your heart, in your life early and walk by it. Listen, we can't change what we've done in the past. We can own what we've done in the past. We can make things right, make things right with God, make things right with those we've hurt. And we can trust God to bring about restoration, forgiveness, change, because he's in the business to do just that. My friend, we're all guilty of breaking the Ten Commandments. We are sinners before God. That's why Jesus came. He came to pay the price for our sin. He came to be our Savior. He died on the cross and rose again from the dead. And if you'll put your faith and trust in Him, He will save you now and forever. So pray with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself, but Jesus, I believe that you're God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I surrender my life, my heart, my all to you. Forgive me, cleanse me, save me, come to live inside me, change my life. And I promise to follow you all the days that you give me. In Jesus' name. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. If you just prayed that prayer with me, please let us know. The contact information is there. We wanna pray with you and help you any way we can. Listen, you're important to God and you're important to us. And we're here for you.